All right, welcome everyone to this May 4th storage provider meetup. I thought we had a good one two weeks ago that fell on April 20th, and this one falls on May 4th. So may the 4th be with all of you on this day. <laughs> I just wanted to start off with acknowledging uh, that we had a pretty successful call to action last week. So if you remember in the last storage provider meetup, I mentioned the XNS cloud Twitter account to everybody. At the time we had just under 200 followers and now we have 400 and change. So thank you to everyone who answered that call and uh, gave that account to follow because that's going to play a pretty important role on this network uh, already today and certainly so moving forward. That's where all your data is coming from. So uh, very much in your interest to keep up to date with what's happening there. Uh, also want to start getting into the fork kind of right out of the gate. We're going to start hot. So uh, the SPD 1.8.0 version is out. So this is the fork ready version. The fork, uh, in case you don't know when it is or you just haven't been paying too much attention, uh, it is taking place on May 15th or 16th. Of course, since time doesn't exist on blockchains, uh, that's not a joke. It literally doesn't. Um, it is taking place at block height 238650. So that is expected to fall at some point on May 15th or 16th, depending on your time zone. Uh, so just make sure that you're updated to SPD version 1.8.0 by then. So at this point, DIYs of all shapes and sizes, whether you're on a, a full license or a basic license, you already have what you need to update. Uh, and a number of people have already been doing that over the last several days, so that's awesome. Uh, you will need to update or you're going to lose all your data, lose your contracts, nobody's going to be happy. Uh, and we're not going to be happy because you're restoring our data. So <laughs> we would very much like you to continue being a good keeper of it. And we'd like to keep paying you for it. So please update. Uh, Examiners will be updating over the next little period. So uh, hardware Examiners, of course, you know, you hopefully you know the drill by now. Uh, you don't really have to do anything other than just uh, check in, I guess, a couple days before the fork and make sure that your unit is updated. But the updates run automatically, uh, but we haven't begun pushing those updates out yet. But we will soon. So I think that's all of the storage providers covered there in the span of like 90 seconds. Hopefully now all of you know what to do, right? Continuing on, so the web wallet, we should have a version release uh, around this weekend, so in the next couple of days. Uh, that is also updated for this fork version. Uh, we are still working on the multi-factor authentication stuff that was discussed in the last storage provider meetup. Uh, we're not 100% sure if that will be ready in time for this fork release uh, or not, uh, but we'll let you know either way when it comes time. And uh, yeah, we're going to have that new updated web wallet out in the next few days that will be uh, running under the hood, that SPD 1.8.0. So it will be happy and ready for the fork. For storage providers, we have our April incentives paid. So that's, I like touching on that when it's uh, the first call of the month. So the April incentives have been paid out. They were, if you're keeping track, they were one day late. Uh, sorry about that, but I do appreciate that nobody came running into the Discord and uh, screaming any obscenities or anything about it. <laughs> uh, appreciate your patience, of course. And now time for some announcements. I'm just keeping an eye uh, out of the corner on the chat, and I have no idea what's going on in the theater chat right now. <laughs> Nobody fall for it. Don't say it. I'm not even going to say it on voice channel. I don't know what's going to happen. We don't know where uh, Automod listens. Anyway. <laughs> oh boy, which of the two juicy announcements do I want to go with first? I'll go with the one that's really hot off the press. So this came out like 10 minutes before I turned on my microphone here today. So this is really fresh. We have some Examiner deals and sales and a new model that's kind of interesting. So let's start with that uh, that new model. So we are now selling the Examiner as like a, a chassis. So it comes without drives. Uh, pretty much any three and a half inch SATA hard drive should fit. Uh, the unit will auto format it once it's plugged in. Um, but that's essentially an Examiner model where you provide the drives and we provide everything else. <laughs> so that is now being sold, uh, for a limited time at 995 us, uh, regular price 1195. So that should be very interesting for people that already have their own, uh, hard drives. They have some of their own equipment, uh, and they see the value in an Examiner. Um, but just kind of 
were a little hesitant maybe because they figured they already had some of the equipment. This is now a really good model for those kinds of people because we've been hearing from them uh, over the last year or so. So happy to finally be able to offer that. All the X minor goodness, just bring your own drives. On the other X minor units as well, so the 16 and the 64 terabyte models, we are also, uh, for that limited time, offering $200 off. So that would bring the 16 terabyte down to $1495 and the 64 terabyte, let me double check, down to $2495. That's a smoking deal. I don't have to think about getting another one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's all very exciting. Good time to buy an X minor. Uh, and also kind of a, a minor announcement that it looks like Examiner uh, related announcements are falling under the Exanet services banner. So in the future, if you'd like to keep up with what's happening with Examiners, definitely give that XNS cloud account uh, a follow. We're on Twitter and Facebook and probably anywhere else you might want to find us. Um, and that's where future Examiner announcements are going to hit first. The other announcement that I think will be interesting for storage providers, uh, this has to do with basic licenses. We've not forgotten about you guys, even though I think some of you have forgotten about us. Uh, we would like to also, well, I'm going to make a bit of a pre-announcement today, so more details to come, but you heard it here first. Uh, that basic licenses that were uh, kind of sold or activated before October 31st, um, of this past year, obviously, so October 31st, 2022, uh, we are offering an upgrade uh, to full for $150. So that's down from the, I think, $350 normal uh, price. So basics can upgrade to full for $150. And there's also a, a bit of a kicker that we're throwing in there too. It'll ha That'll uh, have a similar remit mechanism to the previous full licenses. So since basic licenses, I mean, we kind of made sure that everybody got a rebate back in the day. That was pretty generous of us now that I'm thinking about it in hindsight. So everybody got an, some kind of SCP rebate. Uh, so if you take us up on that deal, which you totally should, uh, we're also going to kick in a thousand SPFB uh, through that remit mechanism. So I think that's about as sweet of a deal as we could possibly make it if you are a basic and you've maybe seen... Uh, what full licenses can do, or maybe you've run your uh, basic for a little while and you've uh, kind of realized that, yeah, to an extent, they don't really run themselves. Uh, there's a lot of manual intervention. Uh, or maybe you just want to support the devs because <laughs> I certainly think they're cool people. Uh, yeah, lots of good reasons to go for that, uh, that offer. More details to come, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to make everybody aware. So that might start in, I've been told, about 10 days or so. So that is kind of the immediate future, but not like tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Moving over to the Exonet Services side of the house. So I was kind of looking over my notes for some of the things that we talked about in last week's call. So we touched on pseudo removals last week, that that was still uh, on target. And now that two weeks has passed, I can say that uh, yeah, everything kind of stuck to the timelines that we set out. So billing is now live uh, with pseudo removals in place. Uh, if you give me like 30 seconds now, I'm going to explain what that means. <laughs> so on most traditional clouds, when you upload data to the network, uh, let's say you're using AWS or Azure or somebody, uh, if you upload data to them, uh, well, typically a couple things will happen. They will charge you for uh, the space that that is taking up. Also, a number of them will charge you for the bandwidth cost. So that's called ingress. Uh, that's not a thing on our end, or we don't pass uh, ingress on to the customer. Uh, it's kind of a flat rate. We're happy to be able to do that. Uh, but anyway, so even if you were to upload a bunch of data, and then like a month later, you decide you don't want it anymore for whatever reason, and you were to delete it on traditional cloud, uh, they would still bill you for three full months. So they have a 90 day duration policy. Uh, so that means, yeah, even if you upload something and then delete it shortly after, uh, you're still on the hook for paying for it for a full like three months. So that's a pretty typical policy in uh, cloud, in cloud storage. So we have a, because we just have to be better, we have a 60 day duration policy. So that way uh, you're not 
kind of on the hook for quite as long. Uh, I think that's still pretty generous of us. Uh, so yeah, on our network, if you upload storage, uh, we, the reason it's called pseudo removals is that we're kind of implementing the removals in the billing stage, not actually on the network layer. Uh, that's to come. That will be like full removals. Um, that's what we would like to do, but that's a, a bit more work. And we knew that uh, it was going to be a little too ambitious if we tried to target that for the end of April. So we've implemented the pseudo removals, which as far as the customer is concerned is uh, pretty, pretty identical. Uh, you're still, uh, it's kind of in line with everything that I've described here, where uh, if you upload storage, you, you know, have 60 days, I guess, where if you delete it inside that period, then uh, you're still paying for it for those two billing cycles. But after that, uh, then it's off your bill. Uh, at other cloud storage places, it's three months. Um, so that's in place today. So billing is live with pseudo removals. Uh, hopefully before too long, we'll have like full actual network removals and that's just kind of neater, but that shouldn't be a hold up for anything. So for all practical purposes, uh, it's everything's already as you would expect. Now looking through my notes here. So this billing is live. We are still using the $7.99 per terabyte per month pricing. Uh, this prices in everything that uh, could potentially complicate uh, using a network like ours. So I think of that ingress and egress that I touched on earlier. So on a, on a number of networks, particularly cloud and kind of storage networks, uh, not only are you having to pay for uh, the network kind of hosting your data, but also if, if you want to upload more data, you have to pay for the upload bandwidth. And if you want to download your data, like access it, uh, they charge you again for that uh, egress bandwidth. But on our network, it's a flat rate. Uh, none of that is really a thing. Or I guess if you get really ditty gritty, it kind of is a thing and we're just eating the cost. But uh, that's fine. It's not too expensive anyway. So that's $7.99 kind of flat rate per terabyte per month. That is kind of flexible. So if that's a barrier for you, definitely uh, get in touch with us. I mean, we're not going to totally race to like $1 a terabyte a month or anything, but uh, we do have a little bit of wiggle room on that and stay tuned because that might, that number uh, may change uh, before the end of the month, but you didn't hear that from me. Looking over all the good things happening in Relayer land as well. So we have uh, in the latest kind of Relayer 2.1.0 that I think I discussed mainly, uh, or I went over in, in good detail in the last storage provider meetup. So I wanted to explain some of the significance of what's going on with the kind of file manager and IAM tabs, uh, which I'm totally happy to do because there's a bit of nuance to that. And I think it um, only really makes sense, the significance of it, if you've actually spent some time with it uh, and seen its possibilities. So within the relayer, we have a tab called the file manager. And this file manager is where you can create buckets, you can create uh, kind of folders within those buckets, or you can put files directly in to those buckets. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of a general uh, portal, I guess, to be able to kind of view what's going on on the storage side of your relayer. And now, uh, with that latest relayer version, we've also added some insight into tracking uh, the usage of buckets. So you can see the kind of history of files being uploaded to a certain bucket. Uh, that's also able to kind of be hooked into billing as well. So potentially you could actually see uh, which bucket is costing you more than, or if you see your bill, you could actually kind of see uh, where that source of uh, the different components of the bill is coming from. So that would be pretty neat. And the IAM module or identity and access management, what this allows, uh, this kind of has some synergy, so to say with the file manager. So the IAM tab allows you to create different users. You can, uh, have you know full control over the credentials of those users and importantly the uh, policies on what they can access so this makes a lot of sense for an organization that has a couple different seats or like m multiple seats if it's not just one person uh, using the relay or if there's multiple people and some of them are only need access to a couple buckets and uh, yeah if somebody in engineering needs access to a different set of buckets than somebody in accounting who needs a different set than somebody in HR. 
uh, then that's how you would go about doing that. And even within those different organizations, some people might only ever need to write and not have to actually read the buckets, that kind of thing. So all, all this nitty gritty uh, security and kind of policy uh, that takes place in the IAM uh, module. And that is going to pair really nicely with Relayer MT. So Relayer MT or Relayer Multi-Tenant is a product that we're bringing forth. We're currently taking orders on it and they are built to order. Uh, but this is kind of a, I guess in the way like an Examiner where it's not just hardware and it's not just software, it's kind of a whole package. So the Relayer MT is uh, a device that uh, is a fully capable out of the box Relayer. So you can set it up, like plug it in, give it power, everything. Like it is a, a server grade computer, uh, but the software that it's running is ready out of the box to become a relayer for you. Uh, it can do all of those things that I've already mentioned, like setting up different users for uh, different purposes. And it's kind of prepared uh, the relayer MT. We've kind of geared it at least in uh, conceptually to favor really well to our partners. So, our partners are anticipating not only having different users on uh, the same relayer potentially, uh, but if our, if we have a partner running Relayer MT, uh, which is going to be a thing by the way, then what they can do is also have not just different kind of buckets for different users, but actually have different customers as well at the same time. So if our uh, partners have a couple different clients or a couple different customers, uh, then that's going to be a very nice way to kind of centrally uh, delegate the resources of the relayer and be able to track everything neatly and just have a really smooth end-to-end -end process. So that's coming forth. Uh, we're taking orders on that uh, now. So if that's if that interests you, and it, I, I think it's really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it personally. There's already a picture uh, of what it looks like floating around out there. So come by the Discord if uh, you want to find out more. But I think that's going to be really cool. It's kind of a, in a sense, we're kind of examining the relayer side, if that if that makes any sense. So moving on, wanted to touch on and kind of thank and highlight the efforts of the outreach crew. So if you are kind of in our Discord or you're active on uh, Twitter, you may have run into some of them. But we have a heroic effort being performed by. Uh, a group of kind of eight to 10 or so in our community on a, on a totally voluntary basis, they self-organized and they are uh, putting a lot of effort to hitting the streets on Twitter, um, kind of raising the profile of the excellent services side of, uh, of our project here. So just wanted to kind of acknowledge them. I'm very thankful for the work that they do. Uh, they're already getting uh, some pretty neat attention uh, on Twitter, getting some kind of likes and retweets from different MSPs. And I know that you know what an MSP is because I talked about that a couple meetups ago. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that's really cool work. I wanted to uh, highlight that because I'm very thankful and I think that they're doing cool work. Also wanted to highlight the two fun uncles podcast. So we've touched on that, I think a couple meetups in a row. Uh, but this last one that took place uh, just this past weekend, uh, they endeavored to set up a relayer live on stream. This was something that I, I had heard that they were a little hesitant to do because whenever you try to do anything live, uh, it never works quite how you would like it to, uh, no matter how many times it went smoothly in uh, in rehearsal. So they endeavored to set up a relayer and uh, it actually went fairly smoothly. I think that there was just one minor hiccup. It was just that uh, when they brought the relayer online, it wasn't running the version that they thought it would be, uh, but that was pretty easy to, to get fixed. But uh, yeah, so I definitely encourage you to check out that kind of segment. I think Mike from Helium Street uh, clipped that section. So you can even just see the like five minute little thing of uh, two guys on a Saturday morning getting together, probably a little hungover, and uh, setting up a relay together. So that's really neat. And just wanted to highlight that because they're doing good work as well. So what is this new segment that I'm talking about? Uh, normally, this is the part of the call where I have a lot of fun bringing on a storage provider uh, from the community up to the stage, and we kind of hear from them, do a bit of an interview. Uh, so we've done that maybe the last five or six calls in a row and had great success. That's gone uh, even better than I could have hoped. 
Uh, it's really neat hearing from people of all different walks of life that came upon our community, uh, some knowing a lot, some uh, learning a lot, we'll say, uh, but all very cool people committed. Um, and yeah, I've, I've just loved uh, being able to share with all of you uh, that kind of side of it. So what I'm going to try this week, we'll see how it goes. If it doesn't go well, then we're never going to try it again and forget this ever happened. But I'm going to try doing a little alpha segment. So what does that mean? One of the things that I get out the most from the Discord, and I think a lot of the, our uh, regulars in the Discord do too, is if you keep up, and sure, it's a bit of work. There are a lot of messages every day. Uh, but if you manage to keep up with kind of what's going on or the gist of it in the Discord, uh, I think it's pretty cool how much information and how, how much thought provoking uh, like no, uh, signal, I guess there is in there. There's some noise, but there's a lot of signal too. And our, our dear leader, uh, Faustian AGI, he is known for uh, sharing some kind of really good, uh, a couple times a week, but really good threads uh, that offer good insight and uh, some thought provoking thoughts on uh, on a subject anyway. I'm, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Uh, so I wanted to highlight some of uh, the ones from the past two weeks that I found uh, really interesting and that if you're not on the Discord, or even if you're on the Discord where you're not keeping up with everything, then you might have missed. So I would like to have our first kind of debut in this segment is a thread on kind of network building. So I'm going to read here uh, some kind of excerpts from messages that were in the SPF SCP tokens channel. So hopefully you could find it, uh, but I'm just gonna dive right into it. So quoting Faustian AGI now, nobody has truly figured out how to build distributed infrastructure at scale yet, and all the other nets are bleeding. We are too, but uh, we are too, but after a very challenging year, we are positioned better than all of them. Well, maybe not Filecoin, but that only means that they have a giant pot of funding that allows them to go for years without meaningful customer business. This is what Storage proposed in March. So here he attaches a screenshot. Uh, this is from Storage's forum. Storage being a, a network that's kind of comparable or similar to ours. Uh, it's a storage net and they put out a not very popular post in March uh, proposing that they're going to slash the uh, payments to their providers uh, by a pretty significant amount, unfortunately. So uh, that's what he's kind of alluding to here. Uh, and he refers to specifically 75 cents, where one of the proposed payouts is the storage uh, per terabyte per month. The current payout is $1.50, and their proposed payout is 75 cents to a dollar. So if you remember ours here at Xnet Services or at SC Prime, uh, we're paying our storage providers about four dollars per terabyte per month and that's you know not even including incentives and everything else that uh we have going on so obviously that's that's far below ours uh well it's already far below ours and then they're cutting it even further so he continues 75 cents i kept wondering why storage isn't gaining serious traction uh, but i realized that they are missing some key mojo that's not easily replaced they don't use a distributed ledger technology for contracts, as far as I know, so their story is your data is distributed, but control of it is not. We own your data because you can't openly audit how we're distributing it. So that's being storage. Their quote unquote relayer is a corp owned device that mostly lives in the cloud. In a world that feels right on the edge of slipping out of control, the future will be led by things that return control to individuals and businesses. The relayer is well positioned for this sort of battle into the exponential future. So I thought that was really well said, and he does kind of continue. He now says the year is 2026 and there are 322,000 storage provider nodes on earth. How many of these does Xnet services own or at least to the provider? So that was kind of an open-ended question. Uh, one community member dared try answering. He says, well, maybe zero because that uh, would not be very decentralized then if if Xnet services owned some of the storage providing nodes. Uh, and to that, our dear leader says, uh, why wouldn't we want to be in on the action? It's not suddenly centralized if we owned 10 out of the 120 pieces. Uh, pieces in that case, meaning the erasure coding pieces. So how the files are all split into shards. 
if there's 120 pieces, it, it isn't suddenly centralized if we were to own 10 of them. It's just good business. Plus, if a customer doesn't want to use Accent Services nodes, they can just choose not to in the relayer. True decentralization is leaving it to the customer. Maybe the Accent Services nodes run superior, or set the bar very high, and forces a regular storage provider to up their game. Or maybe Accent Services partners with partners, with partners or confederations or individuals. They lease the node and split the revenue share. Storage provider pays less upfront for a leased device, but gets half their revenues. Also, what if we come into a town and land a bunch of storage customers, but there aren't very many storage providers in that area? We will use keyword and geo-advertising and land a reasonable number, but what if it's not enough? Then Xnet Services steps in and drops a bunch of nodes to complete the EC ratios. There are lots of situations where Xnet Services being a storage provider makes sense. So I just thought that was kind of neat. That That's it. That's our thread. Uh, I thought that was very thought-provoking, and uh, hopefully some of those who aren't uh, regulars in our Discord uh, kind of get a sense of <laughs> the people who are regulars in the Discord, why we're here all day, <laughs> and kind of chatting to each other, because there's some uh, interesting alpha that you uh, miss out on if you're not a regular. So hopefully you're going to try and uh, share some of the highlights with you guys here on the storage provider calls. Um, but I just kind of thought of that segment this morning and, uh, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, then one last thing that I kind of can touch on to further stoke your thoughts. Uh, there was a thread that was posted the other day on Twitter by Masari. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Masari, uh, is kind of a analytics slash analyst group, uh, that specializes in kind of crypto. Uh, they have a reasonably large Twitter following, I guess, but the, their main thing is kind of data insights into various different crypto networks. Uh, they're one of the people who pushed forward the uh, the kind of tagline or the, the phrase DPIN, so that's Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Network. Uh, that's kind of caught on this year, and, uh, and we lean into it a bit too. Uh, that seems to kind of characterize this type of network well. So... Uh, Masari put a thread together the other day that was outlining some of the major DPIN networks. They were showing uh, the kind of daily revenue of a bunch of different networks and, and plotting it. Uh, and they were saying that uh, Storage and LivePeer were the primary revenue generators for DPIN through quarter one. Uh, and then they kind of acknowledged that Helium is launching their 5G network soon, so that could change. Uh, I don't know a ton about Helium and what's going on over there, but I do know about storage and I, I know about uh, decentralized data. So I took a look at this chart and well, I guess this is where this being a mostly audio based production doesn't doesn't carry over very well. Uh, but if you could imagine this chart, uh, the Y axis is probably the most important part of that chart. That's how much money is coming in per day on these networks. And all of them are pretty close to zero <laughs> on this chart. Uh, even the segment leaders, as they pointed out, Storage and LivePeer, uh, they are not generating a ton of revenue. So that was one thing that kind of stuck out to me. Uh, my kind of editorial on that was that this is still very much anyone's game. Uh, even the quote-unquote segment leaders are doing like under $500,000 a year in uh, volume on their network. Uh, this is, yeah, nobody has real significant adoption yet. Uh, it's still kind of anyone's game. And when that adoption does come, it's going to blow everything out. Uh, those kind of charts of where, uh, yeah, the y-axis is like <laughs> zero and then way at the top of the chart is sl slightly above zero. Uh, those are all going to look very silly in hindsight because, uh, yeah, when these deep pin networks take off and I'm, I'm convinced that they're going to, I mean, it's such a, such a good idea. There's so many advantages to structuring a network this way. Um, that I think it's going to just blow everything up when uh, when those eventually come. So I'm joined now by Ken. How's it going? It's going good. I I think it's Faustian, but but it might be Faustian. Oh, is that my Canadianisms coming through? My bad. I want to go over just uh, actually something from another thread. Um, and it ties in with everything that you covered already, actually. Sort of wraps it all up. 
and people can come back and listen to. To begin with, I have to say that this is not me soliciting uh, capital from anybody here in the audience. I'm not advertising a capital raise right now. Everybody knows we're in the middle of, of that process, but the SEC has some pretty strict rules about what you can do and what you can't do. So all I'm really uh, telling you right now is a, a bit of information from that process so that you can plan accordingly. And, you know, that doesn't mean that you can gear up or do whatever. You might decide for, once you hear it that it means to gear down. I don't know. Um, I'm not telling you to give you any advice on what to do or anything. I'm just telling you because I want to be transparent about the process so that you know what's going on and can make decisions a bit more, uh, you know, intelligently. And so the deal is, is that it's specifically about a use of funds statement that you have to put together when you do a capital raise. And, and what I want to say, first of all, about this whole capital raising process, I, I want to, and I want to speak sort of to the people that are going to long tail this on YouTube uh, as much as the people that are here right now. But um, everybody knows kind of that, that we have found ourselves in a pretty challenging place right now. And it's, it's probably worse than you even think. Um, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. Bear markets do that. And because we are a little different than other projects in the space, some of it's our own design. Um, but the deal is, is that everybody remembers last year that, that we had a number of projected, you know, cloud storage product deliverable dates. And, you know, we really thought we could hit them. And, you know, it really actually stretches into 2021. If you go back, um, you know, I'll, I'll just give you sort of some background on what I'm talking about. <clears throat> IO is really key IP for our stack. And it's this, uh, you know, thing that we designed from the ground up. You know, we forked over some code from SIA, but but mostly we just used it as a framework. And with host IO, it was a completely new thing. And the dev who built it, you know, started out by saying it was going to take, uh, you know, a regular developer maybe a couple, three, four weeks to do. But because he was, he knew exactly the way he designed it, he would just write it himself and it would take him three or four days and he'd have it done by the weekend. And it took nine months, <laughs> right? And because what happened is, is as we started to actually, you know, develop it, it turned into such a significantly more important piece and it had, you know, a lot more to it. And ultimately it became the core of the relayer, right? It, it literally is the engine um, inside the relayer that distributes data out to the network. So, you know, I mean, I think this happens with a lot of different projects and, and you know, software development where, you know, you, you have to make decisions on whether you want to, you know, ship and then iterate that way or you want to just go ahead and, you know, put a, a, a break on things and, and extend your ship date. And we don't really have that choice. And this is something that, you know, as I started getting into talking to people about raising money, that, you know, it's a little different because the very broad overview right now in software development and startups is, you know, iterate, you know, ship fast, ship an MVP, ship broken crap and iterate, you know, and because your customers will tell you what they want, what they don't want. And that's the deal. And for 94% of the products that get built, that's definitely doable and possible. But when you're building a big global infrastructure network, you know, to rival three big behemoths, you know, that have billions and billions of dollars into them and your customer, you know, that you're going to target is business and, you know, you're expecting them to put really important business data and, and critical assets on this network, 
you know, there's really no way to do an MVP. <laughs> you know, we could prove that it worked and we did, you know, um, a couple of people were using the relayer as early as two years ago and storing real data on the network and, you know, asking why we didn't ship, why we didn't get this product out there. But when you really started to plumb into that and understand the, the, the what was built and what wasn't built, anybody who tried to use the thing for real data was going to fall in one of, you know, 22 different holes. And I just kept sort of feeling, you know, th there's a, there's a, a phrase out there. You only get, uh, you only get once to make a first impression or something along those lines. Um, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. I don't know what the phrase is. And I just kept sort of thinking that if we got out there and, you know, people kind of like fell into this thing and they said, yeah, I mean, it's cute, but it's never going to work or whatever. And then we'd have to kind of like fight back against, you know, all that when it, it just didn't make any sense. So, you know, we talked about having a soft launch in January of last year, and then we went out and did a trade show and then the contractor broke down. We went back and we, we did a very significant upgrade there. Uh, we fixed some things in terms of how con stale contracts work. Um, we had a lot of work behind that having to do uh, with sort of the ongoing contract statuses and renewals and so forth. And then we kind of got towards the end of the year. And then what became really clear was that the whole front end was not even you know, working wasn't in place and needed a lot of help. And so then we kind of started in on that and, and then that drug out a little bit further. Okay. So what was going on during that whole period of time? Well, you know, I was talking to our, our, you know, original angels and they were getting more and more surly every single day. Uh, because we were in a bear market, right? The coin price was going down and, and, you know, they were starting to feel whatever, you know, regret. I don't know what they felt. I don't really care. Um, but it, it became really clear that there wasn't going to be much assistance coming out of that, you know, group. And so I kind of just, you know, turned away from it. It actually, in a couple of cases, got kind of nasty, actually. But, you know, in, in that sense, I'd like to feel like I'm, you know, fulfilling the Brian Cox role here. But uh, anyway, what ended up happening is we get kind of into this year and, and going forward. And, you know, I once again reached out to those guys and said, look, I'm not asking for my input. If you know anybody to refer, now would be a really good time. And there wasn't any referrals that came across. And, and the reason, I think, was primarily just because of where markets are right now. I think everybody's really in this place and it's just really kind of frozen. So um, in October and November, we had gone out and we had pitched some venture capitalists and we took, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 calls, I guess, when it was all said and done. And they all went really well. Every one of them went really well. They do sell this thing pretty well. So at the end of the day, the calls did reflect our progress. They reflected the quality work done by the team. They reflected the fact that we built a great network with all of you guys. And they reflected my ability to talk a lot of bullshit. So, you know, they went well and none of them went anywhere. And the reason they didn't go anywhere was primarily the same was that, well, we're, we're, we're stalled on, on new raises right now. We're just finishing up things that are going on and we're taking a wait and see attitude. And then FTX melted down. And that just made it worse, right? So, so at that point, I just, you know, said, well, you know what? It's a, I'm just going to have to pause on this, and we'll just stop and wait until we get the product delivered, and then we'll go back out and we'll do it for real. And I thought at that point in October and November that the product was going to be delivered in January, <laughs> and, and you know, it didn't, and we kind of continued to do our thing. And so, uh, a lot of that's on me. You know, maybe most of it's on me. I don't know, but I'll, I'll own it. And at the end of it, what ends, ends up happening is, is we start to get into February and I can see the finish line now um, by taking a bit more or a different sort of approach, I guess we'll call it. And what ends up happening is, is we finally get the thing out the door here in April. It's still not perfect, right? Um, 
you know, I, I want to just actually do this here real quick. Um, I don't know how this is going to work because I've not done this in the theater yet, but let's see how it works. So I'm going to share some my screen here with the with the website, and I just want to show you this. So we fought this long internal battle um, internally because there was this this weird thing, you know, when the humans really needed to come into the game that uh, I was really struggling with, and it was that it was really hard to set up a relayer, and it was really, you know, a challenging. It was a challenge, right? And and here I am sitting here. I've said this from day one. I wrote the relayer docs literally back in 2018, by the way. So the relayer has existed the whole time as far as an idea. And I said in the very beginning, I said, you know, people that use it, AWS or Azure or Google or even some of the second tiers, they just are going to balk at this idea of having to run something separately until we can actually get the marketing messages out there about why you really want this, why you want to control your own data, why you want this power to hold this. So you want this device in your facility. You want this thing to set up this relayer in your facility. You know, we didn't have that messaging quite fully fleshed out. Plus some things hadn't happened yet, right? Like, you know, Jeff had posted some articles about, you know, cloud storage was moving back off the cloud into on-prem and hybrid. And, you know, that's been a trend for, for some period of time now. Um, it's not slowing down, by the way, the, the cloud uh, uptake. We're still on a, a, a trajectory of increased cloud uptake as we were before. It's just what's happening is a lot of people are starting to realize that they have multiple clouds in operation. They need to get better control of their cloud work. And ultimately, they're starting to do that. And part of that has to do with these devices that are living locally. So that that's good for us because it really helps our messaging. But then the second part is um, that our messaging is now becoming pretty clean as far as owning your data. You know, when you send up data to any of the big clouds or even the second tiers or whatever, or even people in our space, what ends up happening mostly is that you send up full copies directly to a centralized entity. So at some point, they own your data, whether it's encrypted or not at that point they own a whole piece of your data um, if it's encrypted then it's a little trickier but if it's not encrypted they own your whole data and they can actually do stuff with it they can they can lose it they can turn it over to governments they can you know do all kinds of nastiness with it um, you know some of it just you know accidental and some of it maybe malicious who knows but the point being is that they can, and that's where most of the data breach type stuff happens, either in transit or when it hits that site. So one of the key features of a relayer is, is that we do end-to-end -end encryption. That's something we've talked about from the beginning. And I always thought that was really powerful, and it certainly is, right? Because I think I read a stat recently that something like 67% of the stuff that's in the cloud right now is sitting up there unencrypted. Now, AWS is making a concerted effort to get people to go back and apply a crypt encryption to stuff that they already have up there. But it's just like people here. You know, there are a bunch of storage providers that never show up for these things. They never even listen to the videos or whatever when they're put out afterwards. And they show up later when there's some really defining event that they really needed to know about and then say, yeah, I've been paying much attention and so forth. Well, you know, a lot of that's the same thing with all this data in the cloud. I'm sure a lot of that data is going to sit there forever unencrypted and whether it's important or not, whether it has personal details in it or not, whether it's, you know, uh, got some financial stuff, I don't know, but um, it's not a good situation. So end-to-end -end encryption is definitely a thing. I mean, it's, it's really a, a very valuable part of our deal and client forcing client side encryption with an easy way to be able to recover is definitely a huge strength of the relayer. It's it, it it is by far one of the you know top five features of the relayer. But I got to thinking about it recently, and I, I really came to understand client side erasure coding is actually more important. And you know when you talk about the 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 nines, all of these services, eleven nines has become sort of this you know mojo, this this totem. Uh, a Cohen really for our industry and nobody puts their math out, right? Nobody puts any real hardcore math out about how they arrive at 11 nines, 
But if you think about it with AWS, I mean, it fails immediately on its surface. You upload a full copy to Virginia, right? And so then it's sitting there in Virginia and then uh, it's replicated to another AZ, right? So now you have these, you know, two full copies online. And then internally, they apply erasure coding like crazy in order to really make the stuff secure. But I mean, how many times in your life have two discrete things failed? It, it happens all the time. And especially if you're talking about internet type stuff, to have a couple peerage points or other kinds of big switches or, you know, a whole part of a country goes down because of weather or force majeure type stuff, you know, you're going to go, you're going to end up having an offline event because two things went down, you know, at the same time. That's not 11 nines. That's absolutely not. So that's the whole beauty here of client side erasure coding. You have the equipment that does the erasure coding, and that sends it directly out on a row by row, indexed row uh, basis to 120 nodes. And then the other thing about that that I, I think we've been given, we've given ourselves short drift towards is that, you know, the whole SIA notion of erasure coding has really, I think, proven out to be the standard that's being used by almost everybody that, that does take part in that. Storage copied them in their version three, ultimately. Um, you know, we obviously adopted it immediately when we forked over their base coding and contract scripting. Uh, but their thing essentially is uploading data sets. And we, in our uh, process of building host IO and the, the cache uh, uploads that happen, we wrote, we upload what are called indexed rows. And so what, what ends up happening is if you have a data set that you want to upload, and I say our EC ratios are 80, 20, 80, 40, so they're 120 pieces. Um, it's not the case that your data set is all going to 120 nodes. In fact, you have to choose in the relayer a lot more than that. And then what happens is, is indexed row one might go to 120 nodes. Indexed row two of the same data set might go to 70 different nodes and, you know, 50 or whatever the math is to the same nodes, right? So, so what ends up happening is over the course of the entire data set, not only are you being spread out immediately to a bunch of nodes, but it could be as many as 500 or more, right? Depending on what your... Uh, provider set is that you choose. So not only did we improve upon what the SIA folks are doing, I think we proved a very superior model that's going to prove industry-wide to be the, the, the best practice when it's all said and done. And the best part of it is it happens at the customer side. I never see your data. It never comes to me. I never have access to your data. I don't know what you're uploading. I don't care. And at the end, you upload directly to those nodes encrypted and sharded into all of those bits and pieces, pieces, which makes it essentially the single most durable cloud service on the planet. And these are the kind of messages we can bring to the table, right? And it's crazy that it's taken kind of this long for us to get there, right? You know, but it... But it, but it is the case. And so this is where we're at. So um, the situation here coming back, circling it all back around to the cap raise thing. So essentially what happened is, is I just sort of stopped. You know, I realized our, 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 our current people had totally tuned us out. They didn't believe we were ever going to ship. The people that, you know, we talked to last fall weren't really there. And the other biggest complaint that the people had last fall is, well, show us how you're going to get to revenue and how we're going to get to an exit. And, you know, internally, we, we were talking about, well, you got to come up with some pro formas and stuff. And pro formas are just simply projections of what you think are going to happen. And what ended up in that situation is I just balked. I just said, <laughs> if you want me to just make some numbers up, I can do that. But they don't mean anything and they don't they aren't going to mean anything and got a little bit of pushback from a few people but ultimately we didn't have pro formas and the reason specifically why we didn't have pro formas 
was because we didn't really understand the model clearly uh, the way we thought we did. So what happened was I spent the last six months really, really studying our model and understanding what we want to do and studying helium and studying, you know, the rest of the world in, in terms of what's going on. And, and, and ultimately, then I got comfortable to the point where I could start to build a pretty good performer and did. And then, you know, as things happen the way they're supposed to happen, uh, we did have one of our, our original investors come and approach me and say, look, I've got an opportunity. Let's, let, let, let's do this pitch to these people. And I won't get into it because it's, it's, it's specifically right now very much a no talk about situation, but because we're still involved in, in the conversation. Um, but the, the deal was, is as I went and did the first pitch, I realized, well, this pro forma isn't quite right yet. And I just took in a whole weekend and, you know, 30, 40 hours and just really ground out what I believe is the right pro forma going forward now. And it's very, it's very much a developed pro forma from what the original one was and has some very specific ideas. There are some things though that you'll understand and recognize, and then I'll conclude this and wrap this up about where I'm going. And so the first thing why I'm showing you this screen right here is that we couldn't really go out and start to onboard storage customers with the console that we had before. So we looked at Oracle, we looked at a few others, we started to turn the console to look a lot more like what they look like. So now when you go in here and you click on your account, your billing, you get something that looks pretty standard in the industry and so forth. Um, you know, some of these other ones, like when you go and click on deploy, we'll take you to set up a relayer. We have a lot of work to do there, but I think right now this billing one and the setting up of your account is more than enough to get us off the ground and to start selling the product. So when I go out and I pitch this now, I can show these people something they're used to seeing. We didn't even have this two weeks ago, right? So, so that was really kind of an issue and, and keeping us back. So, so now we're in this place and I have this performance. So let's talk about the performance just briefly. I'm not going to get too much into it, like I said, because of, you know, regs and all that sort of stuff. And then I'll talk to you about this use of funds thing that I'm talking about. So the, the notion here is that we looked at Helium and they went from, you know, 2000 to a million nodes. And with a million nodes, they were roughly 300 to 600 bucks a, a node. Uh, I don't know how much the Helium team earned off of every node sale. I don't know what their licensing structure looks like and how much money there is in there for licensing. But that $500 number seemed to be pretty, you know, standard and generic and easy enough to model off of. So our standard, you know, node when you get it out there is probably 3x once you get rid of the rebates and all of the stuff they're over. So I've been banding around this number of 300,000 nodes. And if you look at Helium's timeline, Helium started in 2013 and then, you know, paddled, dog paddled for five years trying to figure out how to do what they wanted to do. And then along came crypto altcoins and they, you know, got the bright idea and off, off to the races, obviously it worked. I mean, it showed that a tokenized incentive network can really do a great job. They kicked it up to a million nodes and now they're about 450,000 that are actually live because they didn't have any business on the back end to handle it. So one of the things that we built into the pro forma is that we will stop selling nodes at any point in the next five years that we are not hitting a specific percentage in terms of storage on the network, right? So um, I'm not going to tell you that number right now, but it, it's a significant number. It's not like 2%. It's not like 5%. It, it's a real number. And the idea is, is that as long as we are not at that number in terms of amount of used capacity on or used storage on the network, we will stop selling notes. We will ask our manufacturers to stop selling notes. We will essentially put a pause on growing the network. But we also uh, have in that same exact document, zero to 300,000 over the course of three years. So 36 months from now, well, actually 3,000 3, to, to 300,000 in 36 months. You know, they did helium in less than two years. So I don't really see 
you know, us doing 300,000 in three years being all that big of a deal. It's just like Backblaze. It took them 12 years to get their first exabyte of used storage. And then they did their second one in something like two years. And they're probably on to their third or fourth or fifth or whatever by now, because that's just how things work. And that's how it will work with us. Helium takes two years to do a million nodes. We're probably going to hit that 300,000 a lot sooner than that. I know that sounds crazy, by the way, if you think about it. People right now are shaking their heads and they're, they're like going, how's, how's that going to work? You know, you're not doing anything. You're not going anywhere right now. And I understand that that's how the generalized feeling is in, in all of sort of this, this ecosystem right now. But it, it's wrong. And it's just wrong in all kinds of ways. Because as I said, I haven't really been out there beating the street for money. I, I I do every now and then mention to our internal investors that there's this opportunity and they don't take me up on it and they're stupid for it. They're just outright stupid for it because what's going to happen is in a couple of years, they're going to see everything that we've been saying, right? And then they're going to look back and they're going to say that thing. I should have, would have, could have, and they, they didn't and it's okay. But I haven't been out there uh, banging and now I am. Now I am out there banging. The very first one that we hit on uh, the calls again have gone extremely well, but now even better because I've been able to elucidate the plan and the model going forward. The revenues that we are projecting for those years are very, very positive, and and uh, we don't spend much time in a cash negative sort of situation. We we get to EBITDA positive in year one and very early in year one, and there's no reason why we shouldn't for a couple of you know conditions. One is We've just pivoted to a new bull cycle. And I know it still looks pretty crazy out there. We don't know what Jerome's going to do. We don't know if the whole banking sector is about to fail. We don't know anything, right? Um, is 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 Russia and you know the West about to have a full blown World War Three? We don't know. It's really one of these. And then this whole AI thing is blowing up like crazy, and people are wondering if they're going to have jobs in the future, right? So. It's such a really, really challenging and interesting time in history. And, and But here's the thing. Our thing succeeds in any situation. Chaos, great times, mediocre times. People are going to need cloud. And they're going to need ever, ever more of it. When AI really gets going right now, it's just all the early ideation stuff. It's just not even really the stuff that's going to matter. Stuff that's going to matter, by the way, is this. Everybody's like, how can I use AI? How can I fold it in my stuff? And oh, the next big job is prompt engineer and blah, blah. That's bullshit. The, the next thing that's going to happen is all the tools you're already used to using, right? The stuff you use every single day is going to get AI wrapped into it. So, you know, you fire up a Microsoft Word document and you try and figure out how to go ahead and get started. And, you know, the LLM comes in and does the thing, you know, 75% for you. And then you are able to go in and put your own spin on it and polish it up. The, these kinds of things are what are really going to drive that productivity gain. So I, I, I see that as being a gigantic driver of cloud storage in the future. And we're going to be right there to take advantage of it as it comes down the pike. So that, that sort of notion uh, really, really resonates with the investors. And so then I'm going to leave you with this last sort of thing. So we're a raise behind everybody else, right? We, we did something that's kind of hard to do in normal circumstances, but doing it under a full-blown infrastructure ecosystem that you build out completely without stopping at the MVP stage um, would is almost unheard of. It's almost like, how could this even possibly be? But we bootstrapped this whole thing, right? That's the deal. We're here on a bootstrap. And, and that means, you know, I own a shitload of this company, right? And if you think that that doesn't, you know, keep me awake at night and, and drive me every single day, well, you, you know, you aren't thinking clearly. And it's not the case right now where I feel really compelled to give away giant chunks of the company to people because I really don't want to get into a situation three or four years from now where I'm looking back and saying, geez, if we could have only just, you know, continued to, to drive this thing the way we are. I've given... Uh, a really good breakout to all of our team members. And so even some of our team 
who are probably going to dissipate because we can't continue to pay all the salaries right now until we do actually raise. Um, they're going to they're going to be extremely wealthy at some point in the future. <laughs> and they'll look back in hindsight and, you know, they they'll feel whatever they'll feel, but it is what it is. So anyway, the, the, the whole point here is we didn't raise enough from our angels, right? We raised just enough sort of to, to kind of get us off the ground and make it, make it work. Um, and then we didn't take advantage of all of the, craziness in late 21 right we didn't go out there when they were just giving away money good news is we didn't get involved with some of the wrong people we didn't end up in some jackpots that a lot of other startups did um but we did end up running out of runway and that's where we are right now and so that's that's what i'm chasing now in my current raise posture but the good news about it is is this when i go to talk to these people they when they look at the performance, they look at our current cap table, they look at our current, you know, structure and they look at the revenue projections, you know, and, and they make sense, you know, as long as we can generate and bring in storage sales, um, they can see the deal that it is. And the first thing that they say is the thing that a guy in October said to us. And I know I'm droning on pretty long here, but, but I want to really get this whole thing across. Because I know you're not going to read the threads and get the context out of them, and this will be just a one-stop shop for it. So, so the the situation is is that this guy said to us, he said in in October, he said, "I don't understand. You have this whole thing working," and I said, "Well, you know, mostly, you know, we still have to put some of this 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 UX magic on top of it, but yeah, and the relayer isn't you know exactly all that in a bag of chips yet, but yeah, you know, it, it is." And he said, well, I don't get it because this is a series A already. I don't, you should just go back, put your time and energy into auditing your financials, get your polish, put on your product, and then just go and get the real money because this is a $100 million company right now. And, you know, I couldn't argue with him. I agreed with him. I, I've always believed that. Um, but the problem was, is that the relayer was really fucked up and hard to use. So that's part of what we've done in the last couple of months is we made the relayer lead pipe simple to set up. And now it's a joy to use, right? It, it's really easy and it's clean and it's actually pretty fun to watch. You know, it's it's something that's neat. And it's going to get even neater when you get more and more capabilities for provider selections. So one of the things I'm able to tell these people now in my pitches, and as I said, this very first one is still ongoing, so I can't really talk about it. But the, the, the deal there is, is that... Um, they want to know about an exit and it's like typically on an exit on a startup what are you going to tell them you're going to tell them well i mean typically there aren't a lot of you know exits when you're first on pre-seed and seed and this current next this round we're on right now is seed we did two pre-seeds and this is seed and so you don't really start talking about exits until you get past your first institutional round um but the thing i'm able to say right now is is we can start doing the dog and pony for series a within 10 to 12 months there's nothing stopping us as long as we start onboarding storage quickly after we generate uh this next raise from going back to silicon valley and essentially just starting to work the big players and saying look this thing works it's already got this much use it's end-to-end -end complete and by the way <clears throat> we're starting on compute <laughs> so um you know, I think that's going to be just a simple process. And in a in in a Series A, there are ways that I can actually help exit people that are willing to bring on the money for us right now. Not not totally exit because they won't want to. Though some of them will want to take more. But but at the end of it, there will be some de-risking going on. People will want to de-risk and 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 take some fruit. So um, that will be a possibility. So I'm going to just go really quick to what the use of funds looks like because. I think it's really valuable to to what you guys are doing. And if you're sitting there scratching your head and saying, well, where's the storage? You keep talking about the storage and there's no storage. I don't know anybody who buys storage. It's not that's never been my my business, you know, background. I don't I don't know any MSPs personally. I don't I don't swim in those circles and I don't, you know, have anything out there. So there's only two ways that I can really see that that are quick to get us to those places where that storage lies. And by the way, um, you know, if, 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 if a decentralized distributed ecosystem infrastructure 
um, could just easily through some simple brand marketing attract customers, then storage would be way, way, way beyond where they are right now. But instead they're cutting their provider um, payments, which tells you an awful lot about their mistake in architecture. They took the, they took some of parts of SIA, but they took some things and really skewed them the wrong direction that, that SIA never would have done. So I think that's what they're running up against right now. Um, in our case, I think we solved everything pretty perfectly. So coming back here to the, the storage customers, now we're going to get them. Well, first thing I've done is I've gone out there and I've whittled down the people I'm contacting to just people who focus on this stuff with the idea that they focus on this stuff because they have actual connections in our industry and they can go out and they can talk to people about onboarding a lot of data. And, you know, this is the funny thing. And you're, you're not going to believe this or you are. I don't know and I don't care. But I do know that um, this is a fact. We have 66 petabytes or whatever it is in capacity out there. And it seems like it's an insurmountable thing. We've got two petabytes of used. We literally had a celebration <laughs> to celebrate 2,000 terabytes. There are thousands of companies on the planet that have, you know, tens and twenties petabytes of their own data. It's only going to take one or two customers to show up and start spamming the network with all of their stuff to put us into a really clear and, you know, critical kind of upscale. So that's what's coming, whether you believe it or not, right? That's what's coming. And so I'm focused entirely on people investing in this thing that have connections and background and, and, and knowledge in that direction. If somebody came up to me, you know, and in fact, this is probably this, this thing I said at the beginning, which is that, you know, things are happening for a reason and they're happening in the order they're supposed to be happening. Um, if the angels came up to me today and said, well, look, we want to buy in big, you know, I'd probably let a little bit of that money in because we need it obviously for salaries in desperately in some ways we need it for salaries, but I wouldn't go very far with it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow too much of it um, because they're all real estate guys. <laughs> you know, they, they don't know dick about what we do. Right. And then they come and try and, you know, give us ideas about how we ought to do it. <laughs> it's just like, it's not even square peg round hole. It's, square peg and you know there is no hole i don't know so th this notion of talking to people that really know what we're doing has been really refreshing you know the conversation i'm in right now i could tell you but i can't tell you <laughs> these guys they're in the business right they get it and so for them you know if they do ultimately come aboard that'll be a big plus right out of the gate is that they will hook us up and steer and you know, bring people and so forth. So that brings me to the final thing, which is the thing we started with, which is these funds. So maybe you're not understanding this, but you know, yeah, I mean, I got to pay my team. And right now the team, none of the team is collecting a salary, by the way, every single person in that upper right area is now working for you for free. And that's whatever it is. You'll have to decide what that, what that means to you. Um, it's awful. And it's not going to allow the team to hang together. There, we are going to lose team. It, it is what it is. And then we will have to reassemble as we get the, the funding that we need. But the whole notion there on the use of funds is I've got about 40% of the money that we're asking uh, going to personnel. First of all, to pay the people we currently have, to provide some raises because nobody's ever got a raise <laughs> that's worked here for us. And that's going on several years now for a couple of people. Um, and then second of all, to almost double the team, because that's what we need right out of the gate. We need to get the, the team uh, shored up onboarding Bob. You know, Bob's been sitting in the wings. He's still very much every bit as psyched as he ever was, but we just couldn't afford to bring him aboard. And so onboarding Bob and, and, and splitting up the, the duties at the top uh, so that I have more time to get out there and focus on sales and marketing. Uh, you know, is a, a critical function right out of the gate. You wouldn't believe how much time I spend doing bullshit that just keeps me away from doing stuff that can bring storage onto the network. And it it just sort of multiplies in, in this kind of a project. 20% right out of the gate needs to go immediately to compliance and certs. We have to 
get that process and ball rolling for auditing. I think in some ways it's going to be pretty quick for us compared to others because there's some things that we do naturally that some of the cert agencies are going to accept, like end-to-end -end client side encryption. You know, as long as you're using military grade encryption that's well known in the industry, they're going to accept that as a thing, right? And you know, X Cha Cha 2020 is the the um, uh, encryption underneath this, and I think that's a uh, you know well along the line of fitting the bill it's aes 256 if i recall correctly so you know we're in fine shape there so compliance and search i don't know exactly how many companies wouldn't store with us if we didn't have certs but we know it's critical so that is where 20 percent of the fun the fundraise is going to go right out of the gate um another 20 percent is going to go directly to marketing and sales because um, obviously we have none of that going on right now. So we have to kind of get that, you know, ramped up and, and, and working. We've talked about how that's going to happen. It's going to go through the partnering program. Everything that we're going to be doing is steering people to the partnering program. Sure, we'll accept people into retail storage and, you know, we'll work with them. But partners is where it's at. The, the first, the tier one partners, we're going to be putting most of our energy towards. But we will have an affiliate partnership uh, soon where anybody can go out and recommend and, and bring people in and, and then get a little cut of the puzzle once they actually get you know somebody onboarded. And then the last one um, is going to happen immediately as well. So understand what I just said there. I said all of these things are going to have a huge component of immediacy, right? It's not like we're going to get this raise and then we're gonna like sit on it on a runway for the next two years. What's gonna happen is like literally half of the money that we get coming in the door is going to be going out the door right away, right? And then our runway will be significantly shortened, right? For, for the ongoing salaries and so forth. But the beauty of that is, is as I said, we can pretty easily be EBITDA positive month three, <laughs> right? It's a beautiful model. It's crazy beautiful. And I'm really happy I happen to own a whole bunch of shares of stock in it. Um, but the deal there is the last one is exchange listing and market making. And this is the thing that's really held us back for years and years and years. Um, you know, we, we did get some exchanges and we didn't understand it. There's not really anybody out there that'll just teach you this thing. What happened with Probit was really an eye opener because I've kind of gone back. Well, not really sure what happened there. What happened there, I wonder? You guys don't want to talk about exchanges, I guess. Well, let me just finish here because this is, this is literally the last two or three minutes. Um, so the notion here is we went to Probit and Probit took a Bitcoin from us back when Bitcoin was higher than what it is right now. I don't remember what it was costing. We got onto Probit. There wasn't any, uh, you know, volume. And so what happened was they had market making that they gave us for like 90 days. And in their view, market making is just wash trading, right? And they did it. And so in our thing, and look, <laughs> this, is, this is crazy what's happening right now. So well, now all of a sudden everybody's showing up, right? We're, we're not going to go through this again, right? You're going to have to go back and re-listen to the first 90 minutes or whatever it was you're going to be totally confused because i'm starting at the end you're going to get two minutes of conversation and then i'm going to hang up the phone um you know, never a dull day around here anyway what happened with the probit was we were going to get you know binked or whatever probably and i just was waiting for the year to end to see what would happen and what happened was is they the wallet started freezing up for some reason we couldn't figure out what was going on and I kept arguing with them. There was nothing wrong with the wallet. And they kept not telling me the real story of what was going on. But later on, I came to understand through this behavior of their really asshole rep, uh, the business developer guy, that essentially they were taking us hostage and they needed money from us. And they didn't have a process in place to tell me in the beginning that every year we're going to have to re-up for that single Bitcoin that we did. And... That's how we stay on the exchange. Or the other thing is, is we have to get market making in place. And he, he never actually came out and told us that. 
Instead, it was always this weird bullshit. And it, it just was maddening type stuff, stuff that would make you want to go fly somewhere and meet the guy to beat the crap out of him. And it, it's just an awfully weird way to do business. And that's how they did it. And ultimately, we decided to leave because couldn't have him taking custom community members wallets hostage. It was sick. But it was a bigger exchange. And at the same time we were there, we were also on an exchange called WhiteBit, which is now 18 on CoinGecko. So a big exchange, one we could have probably done well with. But we didn't have market making understanding under our hood and we didn't have any money for market making. Even if we did, you know, all that meant two years ago to do market making was, oh, hey, we'll buy all the mining, you know, yield. And of course, the problem for us is up until two weeks from now or one week from now or whenever the 15th is, um, the mining yield was 100% sold. So us market making would have amounted to essentially us buying 100% of a very lucrative mining yield and we would have been broke, you know, in, in, in short order time. So it just didn't really make sense. The fork is going to make it so that we can succeed now. And so a significant chunk of money out of this cap raise will go directly to market making. It will go directly to paying off a significant exchange and we'll do it ourselves. We have had a couple of quote unquote venture people or investors who've talked about partnering with us and, you know, covering MM for us and all that stuff. But every time you talk to them, it's always opaque and it's always you know, filled up with a bunch of nonsense words where they don't commit to anything, right? In the end, you just know it's just going to cost you an arm and two legs just to get where it goes. And what they count on is they count on the price of the coin going up a lot. So you don't complain and you don't bitch about how much is being extracted by their company, right? So there are a lot of real good market makers in crypto. There's also like 90, 10 really shitty market makers in crypto. And so that's a learning and a knowledge that I've come to, to get now. And so right out of the gate, we will spend a lot of money on that process and get to a top tier exchange. So I don't know when it's going to happen, by the way, right? I don't know if this current thing I'm working on turns into something, but if it does, it'll happen quickly. And then everything I just said will happen quickly. It'll take you by surprise how quickly it's going to happen. If it isn't off this first one, then I'm going to be sending out these cold uh, letters to the 20 VCs that I've identified that are very directly related in our industry, right? And I'm going to, you know, hit them up with a sales pitch to, to bring them aboard. And typically what happens in that kind of a thing, and especially in the cold area we are in right now, um, it, it's probably going to be something like 10 to 16 weeks. Once I start that process from scratch with those guys, but I suspect that I'll be able to do something that you're all familiar with is I'll be able to engender a little bit of FOMO because things have pivoted in the market in general, and we now have a live product and I can show them exactly how it works by giving them, you know, credit so they can try it out themselves. And my guess is I'm not going to go much past two or three before we find somebody to lead the round because it's just, it's complete. It's, it's a full blown thing. And the story's, you know, complete. The, the, the performers work, the, the, the revenues work, the exit plan works, everything works. There's nothing that's missing now. What's missing is we still have a bunch of front end work to do. We still have some work in terms of, you know, the back end, like removals and things like that. Uh, so that's got to get done. And ultimately, that's part and parcel of what we intend to use our capital for as it comes across and, and to get all that thing out the door. And then once we get past that, we will start immediately on compute. So X and minor extremes will get designed and out the door and we will start on compute and compute is the, the, the be all end all of this whole thing. Right. So, um, I know it really feels like we're not really moving, right? And it feels like things are not going anywhere, but you have to really understand where we are and, and why we're where we are. And you have to understand what's going on. I, I'm fully cognizant that we may lose a couple of our good team members before this actually comes to fruition. And, you know, I'll own a hundred percent of that, even though it belongs on a lot of different doorsteps. Um, but at the end of it, it doesn't change anywhere I'm at. It doesn't change my attitude. I'm still as pumped as ever. And 
in fact, right now, I feel like these calls are exactly where they need to be and we're in exactly the place we need to be. And I don't even feel bad for the team that end up leaving. Like I said, they're going to be phenomenally wealthy when they're all said and done. So um, it's, it's great. It's a great time. And, you know, if you're thinking about shutting off your miner right now because of the market and because of the storage, you know, trajectory or whatever, or because of some shit you read in the troll box, all I can say to you is your timing couldn't be worse, but um, that's what happens, by the way, in bear markets. That's that's always what happens in bear markets. I, I'll stop now. What do you think happened here, Henry, in that we had 20 people at 1.30, but now doing a restart at 2.30, we get 65 people. Yeah, that was weird. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, maybe just making a event kind of on the spot just alerted the whole server. I don't know. I'm I'm going to move the next one up an hour because I think, I think maybe this time might be better than the other time. I don't know. And let's see what happens because I think that was it. That was a good sort of live trial of it. Um, but the, the people that showed up late, you're going to have to go back and listen to a video um, when it gets in there. I will uh, stop now um, and turn it back over to Henry to do his standard Q&A. I appreciate everybody listening in today. And, and uh, um, if, you if you aren't reading the threads or understanding what's going on, this should give you a good idea of where we are and, and what's happening internally and, and what you can expect over the next couple of months. Um, next, next time out, we're going to have a pretty difficult conversation about all the basic licensees. Um, Henry told you the good news today. I'll play the bad cop two weeks from now and tell you the bad news. Um, but essentially basic licenses are going to need to get updated to full licenses. Um, and that's just all there is to say about that, but tune in two weeks from today and you'll get that whole story. So that that maybe will get you your your sixty or seventy right out of the gate. Anyway, I'm done. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you for all that. Hey, Crypto Mo, what's going on? How are you all doing? Doing well, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So uh, I I didn't even know you guys were on a couple hours ago, but whatever you guys did, do that again because I got a notification, and uh, that's why we tuned in. So I'm guessing that's why you guys got more heads in this time than last but uh keep up the good work and uh i want to thank faustin for uh all the effort he's put in i know it's not easy to come out here and uh keep repeating yourself over and over again <laughs> so but uh we're proud of you guys and uh we're, we're we're on we're in it for the long run here so yeah thank you thanks for the kind words yeah i think we alluded to it a little bit earlier but there was uh yeah, we saw this morning, uh, we actually have all sorts of alerts in place uh, around our network to kind of log when a provider goes offline or when their contract is marked bad or something like that. And uh, I think we've alluded to this, but Sparky, he sends like five to 10 emails a day out to providers saying like, hey, uh, we've identified like this kind of issue with your contracting or something. Uh, you have like a couple days to fix it or everything is going to go poof. And like 90% of them never fix it and, and don't reply, don't acknowledge it, anything. And we had someone today, this made me cringe when I saw it. Uh, they had an examiner, kept it online for 12 months. And as soon as it hit 366 days old, so they got their 12 month rebate, uh, they unplugged and they had like 800 gigs of data, uh, which is a bit above average. Uh, and yeah, just decided to go offline. So at this point, it's been like a full week. It was no accident. It was like almost to the minute. Uh, as soon as they got their rebate, they said goodbye. So that th these are the kinds of uh, issues that, that plague us every day and that we, we have the infrastructure in place to track and see. But if anything, that actually makes it hurt a little more because uh, then we, we can see it. <laughs> All right, I have one more request to come on stage, uh, give him a chance to get up here, but... If not, then uh, we can probably begin wrapping up. This has been a very good call. It's gone long, but I think you'll all uh, understand. We got <laughs> lots of good alpha today. Hey, how's it going? Going well. I uh, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't hear uh, most of the updates. Uh, I just uh, joined uh, because I just received the notification. Uh, anyhow, 
my question first, like kind of um, uh, regarding the basically uh, uh, the license first, uh, I'm not sure you mentioned about the basic and the full license. Uh, is this something going to affect all of us or uh, some of us? And uh, regarding the storage, uh, so basically kind of uh, uh, I dipped for uh, uh, for some reason anyhow, kind of uh, from 600 to 200. So uh, is it something like uh, we need to wait for or uh, if there is anything from my end, I can kind of uh, make it way better than supposed to. Uh, and um, as well as I want to ask uh, regarding basically the, um, uh, the miner itself, uh, he, because he asked about uh, yesterday about uh, what kind of uh, manufacturer he's looking for. I'm not sure if you guys kind of uh, you're gonna hire a third party or uh, you're gonna keep building ha in, in house. So that's my first questions. Okay, that was three. So I'm trying I'm trying to keep track of them in my head. Uh, the yeah. I'll, I'll address question number two. So that was uh, regarding any like discrepancies with the data on your device. So if it dropped from six hundred to two hundred, uh, if you want someone to take a look at that, you can come to some of our support channels. Uh, and one of our support techs would be wouldn't mind uh, taking a look at that. So we'll kind of sort okay. out there. Uh, the th I'm blanking on the first question, so I'm going to go straight to the third <laughs> on yeah, the yeah. helium manufacturers. Yeah, you're right. So yesterday uh, we put in the channels. We were kind of getting some opinions on so all the helium stuff. We've kind mm -hmm. of as a team, uh, we've kind of observed that mostly from the outside. I don't know if anyone of us on the team really were like deep into helium. Uh, but a number of people in our community and even pretty close to the team uh, have been. So we've heard lots, we've observed lots, because in many regards, it, we have more in common with Helium than we don't uh, in a lot of ways. So we've looked at their model pretty closely and uh, certainly a lot of the community as well uh, has strong feelings on, on Helium. Uh, mm -hmm. and maybe yeah, chat strong. right now, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in helium as well. I'm, and I will, I will tell you this: like, it's a kind of a red flag if you're gonna talk about helium. Like, for me, yeah. it's kind of a, it's, it's, yeah. it does the project at all. Like, kind of, a, I don't know. Uh, but there were definitely yeah. some things that they did right, and I think there's a lot we can learn from. So we did ask yeah. yesterday in in the channel um, what people's experiences were with certain helium manufacturers, and like, kind of did did people have a preferred uh, helium node vendor? because uh, we wanted to kind of be able to distill who who were the best couple uh, helium vendors. I will tell you this from my experience, basically, the average waiting time you're looking for, like, it's six months. Yeah, just, well, that, that, just... that goes back to, like, if you remember early 2022 when we kind of shut off um, the x yeah. sales, that was exactly to avoid a situation like that. Um, yeah, I hear you. That's why I jump in x -Miner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we got a, we got a number of replies to that kind of open question of like what are people's thoughts on different helium vendors uh the kind mm -hmm. of goal with that I, I think we said at the time uh was just to just kind of check them out and potentially reach out and see if they would be interested um in maybe doing something with scp uh, mm -hmm. i don't think i can really say anything more on that or maybe yeah. there wasn't really more to be said on that at this point but that was kind of what our thinking was uh was to see if there were any clear winners and if we could uh, get some partnerships maybe or just see if they're see what their thoughts would be as well as i was have a question regarding like uh sp xm minor and uh, akash uh, it seems like you guys have lots of similarity but uh, i'm always kind of uh, wondering uh, uh, what's the differences and uh, uh, why x minor uh, compared to akash as it seems like uh, you guys you are in the same in the same boat kind of yeah i'm not intimately familiar with Akash. Uh, I think they do compute and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. And okay. they pitch basically in the beginning, uh, when they first start, they pitching the same as you guys uh, start with. Uh, it's basically providing storage and uh, kind of uh, um, uh, getting like kind of, uh, instead AWS basically to offer like for B clients, kind of a small clients, they can as well like take advantage of the storage availability across the globe. Uh, because I'm asking you this question because I'm I'm uh, I'm thinking as well like is it the geolocation has very important part in the X minor or does it really matter 
uh, where you you can kind of um, let's say let's say tomorrow I want to move my X miner to Africa. Uh, is it something like uh, is gonna be kind of a downgrade my X miner or is gonna be kind of uh, something uh, you guys uh, you're looking for basically to extend other places, uh, other countries as well. Yeah, so geolocation definitely matters. Uh, what might be an issue yeah. is is if you yeah just pick up your X miner from one continent and drop it into another. Uh, that could be yeah. challenging, particularly when it comes to like regulation. So a lot of our EU mm. users, uh, they definitely go out of their way to make sure that their data is staying uh, not only within the EU, but even sometimes if they can, uh, just within the country that they are from. Uh, so that it would be a challenging situation if you were to pick up your examiner and suddenly drop it somewhere very far yeah. away. Uh, okay. In terms of performance, uh, performance would also suffer. There's a lot of efficiencies in having your data stored nearby. Uh, like even yeah. other than just latencies, it's even like uh, BGP level stuff. So like routing, there's efficiencies to being nearby and not having to make as many hops. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of considerations. So definitely performance regulation would be the kind of main ones. Uh, but okay. there's also probably tiers of data that that's less important for. So like really cold backups, something where somebody uploads something once and like may at some point try and access it again, but maybe probably not and definitely not anytime soon. Uh, then that would be like a, a tier where maybe performance wouldn't be super important uh, and they can just go with whoever is the cheapest or whoever has the most capacity. Uh, but there are a lot of other uses where uh, those would be considerations. Okay. Yeah, so if there I... is anything, if there Sorry. is anything else, like we as X miner, we can we can help in this project. Beside keep our miner running twenty four uh, twenty four seven. Yeah. So kind of the continuous uh, kind of theme that I think I've been trying to instill among these uh, storage provider meetups is to just kind of get people thinking of how uh, how cloud data is used in their life. So everybody uh, works at different places. Everybody has like a different kind of network of friends or or family. Uh, and, and I've heard stories, even when I've had the storage providers up here over the last couple of storage providing calls, and we've kind of met them. Uh, well, I guess that maybe doesn't mean a lot if you haven't tuned into the last couple of storage provider calls. But I've had various uh, people up here kind of saying what their experience in getting into storage providing has been. Uh, and a lot of them are also kind of involved or at least following what XNet services is doing with the, with the relayer and kind of the biggest ask that I could make, um, in that regard is to just kind of follow what we're doing, understand at least at a high level, kind of why it's important and then try and find ways to apply that, uh, in your everyday. So I think everybody has some kind of awareness of uh, maybe what their work with their workplace, like where that data is going, some of the challenges that might be related. If they have a cousin who works in IT, IT department or something, ask him uh, like if they're using cloud uh, and what their experience has been. Uh, okay. So yeah, just kind of evangelize a little bit. Uh, it's, it's not a big ask, but just consider it. Uh, yeah, play the field a little bit. And I think that would, uh, okay. yeah, if all of us do that, that could really go places. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yeah, you've asked good questions. So cheers. Cheers. Okay, I think I'm going to have to cut us off there. This has gone pretty long, but I'm really pleased with uh, a lot of the interaction we've had. Uh, covered a lot of ground this call. Heard from a bunch of different people. Uh, yeah, I feel kind of renewed with this uh, with this call. I hope you guys get some of the same vibes that I feel. So thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, this has been a very special. Uh, storage providing call. May the 4th be with all of you. And thanks for coming in. See you again in two weeks. Uh, that would be immediately after the fork. So this is the last time you're going to hear me before the fork. Get your storage providing nodes on SPD 180. If you're a DIY, you already have everything you need. Uh, so check the documentation. I promise you that it's in there. And if you really can't figure it out, come by Discord and we'll link you to the right place. If you're an examiner, of course, you don't need to do anything but just kick back and uh, count your tokens as they come in, I guess. Anyway, all of you take care, and thanks for coming. Bye.